this recording is the November 6, 2021 virtual meeting of the NMRA PCR Coast Division. It features Earl Gerbevon with hybrid modeling using 3D printing and traditional materials to create an HO gondola and Dave Ackerman reprising an NMRAX clinic on custom decals. Welcome. Uh, this is the November 11th meeting of the Coast Division. Um, we have a really exciting uh, program uh, of clinics today. We're going to start with Earl Gerbevon, um, who's going to do a clinic on um, an experiment in 3D printing, which uh, turned into what I think of as a hybrid model, where you're combining a new technique like 3D printing with traditional materials like wood and brass to create a not only a unique and great appearing model, but also one that tends to be stronger than those built just with materials like, uh, like wood. And then Dave Ackman's joining us. Um, and Dave is actually from Missouri and is going to talk to us about creating custom decals. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is throw it first over to uh, Earl. And Earl, go ahead and take us through your car you built, which I think was really cool. Okay, let me find the share screen here. So I'm in the process of doing a diorama and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I've got to build something on the order of six or eight uh, gondola cars. And they're all the same, but they're all different. This is kind of a blow up from Shorpy where I get a lot of these photos. These are all turn of the century gondola cars. And if you take a look at them, you've got a high side, you've got a low side, different heights here. And if you look at these two cars in the back, you can see they're actually hopper cars, whereas these are drop bottom gondolas. So I've got a whole bunch of different cars to make. And I really didn't want to have to scratch build each one individually. So over, so I got, so as in getting ready to do it, I started looking at dimensions and uh, Richard Brennan helped me. He took one of the Library of Congress photographs through Photoshop, kind of straightened it, came up with uh, car dimensions. Uh, we also found some other drawings, but even these two, you can see the stake pockets are different. The lengths are different these things were all different and I was trying to not have to again start from scratch on every one of these cars. So this is my new toy. I bought this over the summer. It's a filament printer, not you know the, the resin printer, but I wanted to see kind of what it would do and I figured that gondolas would be a great place to start learning about 3D printing. So there's probably people on this call that know a lot more about 3D printing than I do. So uh, this is my experiments. I've probably learned more since starting this, but it's kind of where I was at the time. The nice thing about this printer is this platform actually is held on magnetically. When you 3D print, you want the print to adhere to the surface. And sometimes it's hard to get the 3D print off the surface. So this whole gold colored piece actually pops right off and you can flex it and your print pops right off. And the surface is reversible. So this side is like a pebble texture. And if I would flip it over, it's a smooth side. And we'll talk about that in a bit on another slide. So, you know, when you start looking at 3D printing things, you say, can I print the entire car or not? And I really didn't know what the limitations were of the printer. I didn't know how accurate it was. I didn't know what it could actually resolve. And when you start playing with the printer, there's things that the printer does and doesn't like to print. And we'll talk about that. Also, you know, the filament, which is, you know, the material that it extrudes, how, you know, is it workable? Can you sand it? Can you file it? if there's a problem with it. And we'll talk a little bit about that also. So I kind of broke it up into the underframe, the deck and the sides. So this is my one of my first drawings of the underframe. This is with Tinkercad. 
And I'm really happy with Tinkercad for doing these kind of things. The program is super easy to use. You come over here, you grab a shape like a square like this, drag it in, resize it, and then just bang, 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 duplicate it across there. And you've got all of your frame rails. The other thing Tinkercad lets, lets you do is you can make your own shapes. So you see these truck bolsters. These are a shape that I made and saved in my own library and I can call them up and then reuse them later. The other nice thing with Tinkercad, if you want to drill a hole like this, you grab this, which you see is kind of shaded, that's a hole. You move the hole where you want it, you resize it, you group it, and you've got a hole drilled. So you guys have now had the intro to Tinkercad. That's 85% of what it takes to do things. There's some other little nuances, but it's super easy to use, uh, much better than SketchUp. And I know there's other programs similar, but again, this is really a fast way to do the drawing. So I did some other embellishments on the drawing since then. And here's my first print. And, you know, it came out not too bad. One of the things I talked about is what does the printer like to do and not like to do? The printer likes to run continuous, you know, prints all around. I tried printing queen posts. I thought, what the heck, let's see what happens. And you can see there's all this stringing because what happens when it has to make an interrupted print, it actually stops, it retracts the filament a little bit to kind of break the, the run of filament and then restarts it. Well, sometimes it doesn't retract all the way, sometimes it strings. And there's some things you can do to minimize that. I didn't sit down and play with it. And then there's videos on the web of how to do it. But again, I was just trying to print it. The other problem with the queen posts is there is a grain to this 3D printing. So nice long stretches like this are super strong, but you know the printer putting little dots on top like this, it's kind of a, there's no grain there, they just pop right off. So when I tried to file them and clean them up, they broke off. So I just gave it up and said, I'll just use Titchy queen posts. So I went back into Tinkercad and modified the drawing. You can see I've got you know, the holes in here for the queen posts. I've got my stake pockets. You can see this kind of shadowy box. Again, that's a hole before I merge the drawing so that I can fit a KD coupler box into the frame. I'd looked at printing the KD coupler box right in there too. And in talking to Fran Foley, he suggested I didn't because it's hard to get the dimensions good enough for everything to work right. And I'm kind of glad I didn't try to print those. So here's my revised print. And I'm pretty happy with it. You know, this is printed at 0.1 millimeter uh, layer height. So you can see there's a little bit of stair stepping on these bolsters but that's fine. You know, I've got something that looks pretty much wood-like. And the thing that I like is I got the stake pockets printed on the side of the car. And that was one of my worries when I looked at making all these cars is having to glue all these little microscopic stake, stake pockets onto the sides of the cars and then having them all pop off when I tried to jam the stakes in and put the cars together. So. I'm really thrilled with this. And as Phil kind of was stealing my theme here, the thing that I like is this whole thing is super strong. I'm planning on actually running these cars and I was a little bit worried about a wood car and the whole thing kind of pulling apart or breaking apart. So, you know, it's one piece, you know, the truck screws screw right in the bolster. These screws for the couplers, there is actually 3D printed material under this coupler box. So the whole thing is super strong. It's flat, it's square. You know, it's kind of a good surface to work from. So I was happy with this. Uh, I have to drill out these holes. The holes aren't perfectly accurate, but I can drill them out for the queen post and, you know, everything just is working well. So I looked at printing 
the plat the deck of the car. And this is that same print turned over, it's spray painted. You can see it's kind of pebbly looking. And this is the pebbly surface of that gold colored plate I showed you on my uh, first slide about the printer. And if I would think about this being the, the deck surface, the pebbly stuff kind of doesn't look like wood. So I wasn't really happy about that. I could flip the, the platform over and print it so that it would be smooth. But then the smooth side kind of doesn't look like wood. I had to texture it a lot and I wasn't real thrilled about doing that. And I could also print a separate deck and then glue it on top. And there's some issues with that I'll talk about on the next slide. But if I, again, if I would want to put a, print this with the wood surface on top, you know, I have to make individual grooves, individual V grooves between the deck boards. And those grooves, when I experimented with it, didn't really print all that well. You know, when you put strip wood boards together, they have their own differences and everything. But when you 3D print, they all come out pretty much the same. I would also have to notch out for the stake pockets. I'd have to cut out for these drop doors. And it just seemed like a lot of hassle. So I just said, I'll just make them out of strip wood. I can do that quickly. And I can notch out as I go for the, the stakes, for the stake pockets, because as you know, deck boards, you know, extend past the edge of this frame. So this is what I alluded to when I talked about printing the deck by itself. This is just a little bracket. The printer, for some reason, likes to make random lines sometime. And you can see that I, there's these random print lines that come in as it moves back and forth. I don't know why it doesn't turn off the filament, but it extrudes these random lines. And then you also get this graining, you know, you can see individual print lines. There are some videos on the web about ways to minimize these kind of things and smoothing and this and that. But again, I didn't play with it. And I was just as happy making things out of wood. Hey, Earl, just as a yeah. side, if anyone's interested, I actually have a spreadsheet that you can use with your 3D printer to identify layers and direction orient them. So you could, for example, make those lines so they moved with the, the case and lined up linearly that way. So if anybody's right. interested, if you're printing, it takes about a minute to align the lines in your print on the top layers. Right, and that's what this note is here about layer controls. And again, this is a print bracket I did for somebody else and it just showed it really well. So now that I got the bottom and the deck figured out, I've got to print the sides and you know, the big question is, you know, what can a 3D, you know, filament home printer do? Can I actually print a scale two by something on edge? And I've got to print this vertically for this to work because you can see there's inside and outside corner plates. So you can't print the sides flat because then you can't get the inside corner plates. So went back to Tinkercad and I thought, hey, this is great. I can just make a basic frame. I can add the corner plates with the little bolt heads on there. And then I can just stack them up and I can print an arbitrary sized or arbitrary height set of gondola sides. And I can also print, which shows up a little bit right there, is the platform for the brake wheel. So I thought, hey, this is great. Uh, let's see what I can do with it. So this is one of the first prints of that. And it actually prints a scale thickness two by at a, you know, this is a two board height, nothing gets distorted or bent. So I thought that was great. I had to put in the grooves between the boards, again, to separate the boards. And you can see, you know, sometimes they don't print all the way. And this is kind of the same problem with the flat deck boards, but yeah, this was okay because it's gondola sides and they get crusty and all that. But you can see when I blew up the corner, again, this is where the corner plates are. You know, the corners are yucky. 
they're kind of an amorphous blob. And as I thought about it, I've got a competing technology, right? I've got, I want this, the boards to be smooth, but I want, I'm sorry, I want the, the boards to be textured, but I want the corner plates to be nice and smooth. So I can't get both of them. You had a question, David? You're muted. You're still muted, I think. There, thank you, Phil. Uh, let me yap here. I just wanted to check if you wanted to proceed through and we should save questions or whether you wanted questions during the presentation. I'm okay during the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So I kind of gave up on printing uh, these end things. Uh, I may go back and revisit printing the wood sides, but you know, making these out of wood really is, is pretty easy to do. And that's what I decided to do. But then I had to go and do something about making these inside and outside corner plates. So a while ago, I bought a whole ream of black printer paper, mostly for making tar paper roofs, you know, that I would overspray and then kind of sand them a little bit. Uh, so I took a piece of paper, sprayed it with Rust-Oleum color, you know, uh, rust colored spray paint, and then cut a strip. This is actually a little L-shaped piece. It's a little bit hard to tell. The nice thing with using black construction paper on this is you don't have to touch up the cut ends. You know, if you think about doing this with white paper, you know, and you cut these things, you've got all these white edges that stick out like a sore thumb, and it's a real pain in the butt to go ahead and kind of cover those over. So I just uh, put that L-shaped thing on my chopper and started chopping out a bunch of little corner plates. And once they were done, I could just sit there and glue them on the inside, the outside of the car. It's kind of a pain, but it goes pretty quick if you don't think about it too much. So this is the completed car. Uh, I've got a 3D printed underframe that I really like. I was able to glue the deck boards onto the 3D print with Eileen's tacky glue that worked well. And, which, and then that made it easy to glue all these other wood members on top of the deck, as opposed to having different materials because the, uh, the filament stuff, you can't white glue, you have to super glue it. And also something I kind of alluded to before with the 3D printed material is it doesn't like to machine. You know, you can cut it with an exacto knife, it cuts pretty clean, but if you try to file it or sand it, it's kind of like trying to file Delrin, you know, where it kind of balls up and it rolls around the corner and it, it really doesn't like to be machined much after you print it. So again, I was happy with this other than my decal being a little bit off over here. Uh, one of the things that Jonathan and Phil and other people and Fran have talked about before with uh, 3D printing is you don't print material, you don't print models so much as you print tools. So I printed a couple little tools, a couple little squares to help me put this together. Uh, I left the top layers off of these two when I was printing just to see what would happen. This is like, you know, your visible 3D print and playing with different percentages of infill. You know, these things aren't solid, they're honeycomb to save material. And you can see different levels of infill. And also you see, this is more of these random lines that I talked about that the, uh, the printer puts in there. So looking forward, I was pretty happy with my 3D print. I liked the underframe that I had. So I went and kind of cut it at a two thirds level and then just took this and rotated it around to that. So now I've got a, a kit, if you will. I can take this and slide it into this one as much as I want and join it. And that gives me the individual length hopper cars. Because again, each of these hopper cars is different. Then I can get these bolsters and stuff, move them in, play with stake pocket spacing, move these over, join them up. And I can just bang, 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 start printing out these underframes. I do have one slide before I close out on 
sort of a different project here, completely different. Earl, Earl before yeah. you do that, one thing I might be interested to do is between what I found is when you print thin cross sections vertically. Yeah. So the head's printing up. For example, I did I did some O scale chairs. And the first time I printed the seat and I printed the front legs just coming straight up off the seat and they were, you know, a millimeter in diameter. So it turns out they're just these little spools of, of print going up and they're really fragile. Yep. What I found is I took those parts and I made them flat, same dimensions and laid them flat and they actually print really well. So one of the things that might be interesting is to turn the queen post 90 degrees and lay them flat and you may be able to print the rest of the queen post flat then. The Save queen posts are okay. It's, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I looked at, at doing that. But I'll tell you, the, the plastic injection molded queen posts from yeah. Tucci are so smooth, yeah. you know, and on a, again, this is a filament printer. This is probably pushing the technology right. of what it's but, supposed to be doing. Right. Uh, I'm saying is that things that vertically won't print when they print yeah. up out of the print, if you can turn them sideways so they print on the bed, the same yeah. dimension yeah. will be much stronger because it's going with the linear flow of the, right. of the you're output. Going, you're going with the grain of the material. Exactly. So, and again, but, I looked at that, but the detail wasn't going to be there. So uh, I went off great. to the injection molded. So I'm going to have one off. Or, or just a quick question. Um, I didn't quite catch it. Did you make, end up making the sides out of wood or did you print those? I tried printing. I didn't like the prints because of the corner posts or the corner plates. Right. So I went and made those out of strip wood. Okay, thanks. And that's what, uh, so I made the sides out of strip wood and then I could make the stakes out of strip wood and then kind of white glue all this together, which kept everything looking the same. If these would have been 3D printed, then I may have had to super glue or tacky glue this onto this. And then I was worried about things kind of not matching. All this stuff color-wise matches on here. Right, so how would you have finished the, uh, um the 3D printed material to look like wood, like you have here. So this kind of looks like wood already. It has the wood grain. Right. And then what I do, what I would do is spray paint this Rust-Oleum camouflage to give it some kind of a tooth, a base. And then if you've seen some of my other clinics before, and if you know of Sierra West, uh, I use chalk. I use okay. chalk and alcohol. And you can kind of paint on the chalk right. with the alcohol. And you would get close to this color. Actually, that's what this is down here, the frame. Mm -hmm. So this is sprayed with Rust-Oleum camouflage and then chalk. Then it looks pretty close to wood. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it does. It looks great. Thank you. How long did it take to print? Um, most things of this size take about an, at the point 0.1 resolution, right, which is the slowest print. It takes an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, which isn't bad. You know, people look at that and say, oh, my God, it takes forever. Well, you start the print, make sure it's started okay, and then you go away, do something have dinner, come back, and the print's done. You know, the nice thing about these also, this print uh, uses, I don't know, two or three meters of material. When you slice it, it tells you how many meters of material it's going to take. And if you look at the price of filament, you're talking six or seven cents per meter. So, you know, all these things are 30 cents or something. So you can make a lot of them, throw them away, and you're not really losing any money if you don't like the print. Earl, Dave Gibbons here. Yeah. Uh, yeah something you might check, uh, I dealt with this in my work um, in digital representations of things, is something called aliasing. And you could have aliasing in the Tinkercad or aliasing in the way that the printer is handling the data. But mm -hmm. those lines, those little lines, can actually be a representative of, of aliasing coming in and affecting the the print those that's what 
I, I dealt with this in, in a totally different field, but it smells like that. And if you see any, it, you might look up aliasing and see whether you see anything. Okay. But I know a lot of it is stringing. And there's a guy, uh, he calls himself Filament Friday. I forget mm -hmm. the gentleman's name that I've been watching. And there's a lot of talk about this stringing and, you know, things you can do to minimize it. No, not to say. So I'm going to do my off topic slide, then I'll go back and close out the hopper car. So this is just something I just finished making. This was a little kit from Foscale Models. And I hate to use the word cute, but this is cute. I really like this. It's, it's sitting crooked because there's a wire coming out the back because there's lights under here and lights in here. But I thought this was just a neat little model to stick in the corner somewhere. So my kind of next steps on this printing project is I'm going to see if I can emboss some bolt heads on these corner plates to make them come out a little bit more like this. But at any reasonable distance, you don't see them on the car. I may or may not try playing with 3D printing the sides just for fun, but uh, I'm pretty happy with the, the strip wood stuff. I, I think this is where you get combined techniques. You just need to have a resin printer for the sides. I <laughs> thought about a resin printer. Right. That's probably the next thing. But you know, the right. nice thing with the 3D with the filament printer is you fire it up, it prints, you come back, it's done. There's no smell. You don't have to clean it and wash it right. and yeah. mess with it. And, so, so Earl, this is great, great work. Um, Jonathan, by the way. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming you used PLA uh to print that's correct yeah so so a material that i've started playing with and i'm beginning to like is there's wood-based filler filaments and so it actually has wood particles in it and you can actually sand it and shape it a whole lot easier and so that might be something worth looking into you know i saw it and i watched some videos on it and i i was a little bit nervous about it because of the texture at this scale. But I, I understand what you're saying. I, I've seen that, it's, again, it's something on the list of things to... Uh, yeah, I, I, w I was playing with it, or I'm playing with it, not because of what I wanted to get out of the texture, uh, more of it's potentially easier to shape and do some post processing on it. And that's what I've been kind of impressed with okay. is it's, yeah, yeah, PLA is, is yeah, you, all you can do is really just cut it. You can't sand it. Yeah, you can't. So the other things I need to do are you know, look at paint colors on these cars and then the fun thing, and I guess this is almost a segue into Dave's presentation, is each car has different decals and different lettering. So that's something else to, to work on. So this is maybe part one of about three or four parts as I work on this diorama. Uh, but this was you know, kind of the pacing item being able to build all these pieces of rolling stock. Earl, this is Dave Ackman here. Uh, I have also worked with uh, the wood impregnated PLA okay. when I was building some structures. And what I was uh, intrigued by was the fact that I could stain it with Minwax type stains. Oh, wow. I didn't realize you could stain it. Yeah, it worked out really nicely. Um, so so that's, a, that's a thought. Um, what did you pay for your uh, printer? 350 bucks, give or take. Okay, that's not bad. What slicer are you using? Cura. Cura. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's what I use as well. I paid about two fifty for an Ender Three Pro uh, about a year ago, and I've been just having a lot of fun with it. Uh, one other thing, you talked about tools. Uh, something I found useful again using Tinkercad is just drawing a rectangle uh, and then drawing a rectangle hole and rotating the one. And I've got an angle tool an angle measuring thing that's yeah. been kind of fun for me. Yeah, I had to make, I worked on a hopper car and I needed some 30 degree angle uh, templates. So I just banged it out of Tinkercad. You know, it's nice with Tinkercad, these little tools like this are easy to make, they're inexpensive and it's really just speeds up the modeling. Yeah. So I guess David, over to you. 
Well, I guess that's a, a great segue. Thanks, Earl. That was brilliant. Um, so, we'll, David, I think we'll throw it over to you, and the floor is yours. All right. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, great. Uh, before I get into this, this clinic is going to be about 45 minutes. And when I do my clinics, I, I generally do them first for NMRAX. And as such, I, I record them. Uh, I build them in uh, Adobe Premiere. So you're going to be seeing a movie where I do the, the narration and, and that type of thing. Uh, I'm going to probably interrupt it from time to time and uh, show what's, uh, what's going, make some additional comments. But this is a fairly new clinic for me. I introduced it back in March, so uh, it's, it hasn't changed too much. Uh, but I'm uh, an HO kind of guy. I'm more of a, a tech weenie. Uh, I've got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in computer science uh, when I realized I wasn't going to be a very good mechanical engineer. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. My layout's the Baden, Voten, DeSmet. Uh, you can see here from the top, I teach clinics on billboards, uh, amazing Arduino animations. Uh, I've got a 3D printing cl clinic about what I learned in the first three months uh, of this. And I say it's kind of like stages of love. Uh, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be complex. going to be a lot of frustration, uh, but it can be very rewarding if you stick with it. And my wife and I celebrated our 49th uh, last month. Uh, I teach uh, 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 custom decals, uh, which we're going to do today. And I teach something called 2.5D CAD. And I wasn't planning on doing this, uh, but can I show a 90 second uh, video on this topic? Uh, because Earl, I think you might find it really kind of fun. So I'm going to do that real quick here. I'm going to go to my website, daackm.github.io. And if you write down nothing during this entire presentation, and I'm going to repeat this address many times, but this is my website, and I'm I'm a documenter. Um, so anytime I discover something, this is where I put it. And in fact, you can rerun my clinic at any time. If you go here, here's my uh, my welcome. Uh, this thing two and a half D CAD using PowerPoint. I'm going to show this trailer real quick. There's got to be another way. If you are a newbie to 3D printing and are reluctant to invest your time learning complicated CAD software to create simple models, well, yes, there is another way. Microsoft's PowerPoint. PowerPoint, is PowerPoint has powerful drawing tools we can use to create useful two-dimensional objects for model railroading. But few people know that these objects can be converted into 3D models for extrusion on entry-level 3D printers. And this clinic shows you how this can be done. Starting with simple rectangles to create city limits and other signs, we will progress to making siding and roofing. Using normally hidden PowerPoint tools, we will punch holes in shapes to create windows. Fences and gates are next, followed by billboard legs, room pods, trestle bents, and more. We will also demonstrate little-known PowerPoint tricks to add and remove points in a shape, as well as alter the path of curved lines. A technique to create layers in the Cura Slicer will also be unveiled. Finally, we will get over our fears of CAD software and show how to be productive using PowerPoint with Tinkercad to create even more sophisticated 3D models with only six minutes of instruction. Will this clinic teach you how to build a model of the Taj Mahal? Nope, but it might show you how to build a doghouse, a shed, or a pavilion for a park. You might even discover you too can use 2.5D CAD to model unique objects for your model railroad.
Let me shut this one down. There we go. Okay, I thought you might be interested on in something. Why are like dental this? companies lobbying down to make this toothbrush Hang illegal on. in the U.S.? This U.S. Army dentist built a device. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so you might find that interesting down the road. If you want to go back to the website, run the whole clinic, uh, see if you got anything that's interesting, uh, interests you. Okay. Uh, are we ready to go on now into decals? For it. Let's do it. Welcome to this clinic on creating custom decals for model railroading. In the next 45 minutes, you will learn how to transform your model railroad into a more distinctive and memorable creation like no other on the planet. Hey, David, will, will you throw the decals. slides into full screen mode? This There's a button at the over three main topics, how to print custom decals, how to design them and techniques for mounting them on support structures. There will be a bit on how they are applied and we will show dozens of samples. We will not be presenting anything on custom dry transfers as that does not appear to be a process readily available to the home or club modeler. While some of the processes are applicable to images printed on copy paper or cardstock, this too will not be covered in any detail in this clinic. So what is a custom decal? For the purposes of this clinic, I define a custom decal as a unique image not otherwise available commercially applied to a vehicle or structure of a model railroad by a wet transfer method. We benefit from custom decals because they help define the time and place of our layout and let us mark things like trucks, buildings, and signs in ways that reflect the identity of things as they are today or reflect the way they were in bygone memories and do so even if we cannot find such signage from any model shop or catalog. Why decals anyway? Can't we just print on paper or cardstock and keep things simple? Well, for one thing, decals are thinner. Textures like roofing, bricks, and siding pass right through without sanding. They are self-adhesive and rarely curl off around the edges. I think they are more vibrant than printing on paper. There are probably places for both, but in this clinic, we will be focusing on decals. It doesn't take much to make a custom decal. Really, it's just an inkjet printer, special decal paper, a spray can of automotive lacquer, and some design software. Yes, decals can be printed on laser printers, but the color on my inkjet is much more vibrant than that available on my laser printer. So I'm going to limit my comments to inkjet printers. I bought my Canon MG2520 inkjet printer back around 2017. I purchased it not because I wanted an inkjet printer, but because my scanner died and I wanted a new scanner and it was more economical to buy a combination device than a separate scanner. It took less desk space too. You may already have a color inkjet printer and if you are satisfied with the quality of your prints, it will probably suffice for printing decals. But if not, an entry-level inkjet printer from Amazon, Micro Center, or an office supply store can be purchased today for under $125. Decal paper is available from Amazon and often at hobby shops and online train stores under the Testers brand. I buy mine from Amazon from a manufacturer named Rolurius, 20 pages for $16.99, because it is much less expensive than from testers and I prefer the quality. But now is the time to make your first decision. I'm sure you have applied decals to models before, and you remember that decals come in three layers, the image itself, the thin carrier film on which the image is printed, and the paper to which the film is attached, which we separate in a water bath while applying the decal. Well, decal paper comes in two forms, white and clear. To be more specific, when we talk about white decal paper, we really mean the film on which the decal will ride is white. It's the same for clear decal paper. It's the film that is clear. While we do not care about the color of the underlying paper, 
we do need to care about the color of the carrier film because it comes in white and clear and we need to decide which to buy. The controlling factor is whether you want the color of the underlying surface on which the decal will be placed to show through the decal. Think about the decals on a piece of rolling stock. If you want the car color to show through, you need paper with clear decal film. But if you're thinking about adding a poster to the side of a building and you do not want the wall color to bleed through, then decal paper with white film should be your choice. If you intend to affix your decal on a white background, it doesn't matter which you use. Yes, there are professional printers that can print decals in white on clear film, but they are not readily accessible to the home market. You may have heard them referred to as Alps printers, and when available in the used market, they are several thousands of dollars and are not the subject of our clinic today. I don't I am guessing that custom decaling I don't think they even make Alps printers anymore. I've seen them on eBay, uh, but you know, they're not the type of thing that, that we're going to normally afford. Rolling stock is not your primary reason for watching today. Your railroad probably uses its own distinctive typeface, which you already can get from Microscale or other sources. If that is the case, then forget about the clear film for now and buy the white decal paper. I promise we will come back for samples of using clear decal paper later. The last thing you need to purchase is spray lacquer, which I get from an automotive paint store in my hometown. Other non-automotive spray lacquer may work as well, but what I use is custom blended by a store I trust, so I use it. You need lacquer to coat the decal after it has dried, because inkjet printers use water-soluble ink and if left unprotected the ink will dissolve when submerged in a water bath. To keep this from happening we spray it with two or more coats of lacquer and then let it dry overnight. Oh, two other things. Get some Microsol and Microset for micro scale, less than five dollars each in the blue and red bottles respectively. I know you are dying to see the process, so here is the overview. Here I am in PowerPoint with the decal for the side of a box truck. Don't worry about how I drew the image or why I use PowerPoint. That will come later. First, I measured the side of my truck to see how much space I had to work with. After that, I drew a box, altered the background color to match my truck, and sized it to match the available space. I added text, then made it curve to a line. I added some clip art and printed the image on a piece of paper, held it up next to the truck, and I liked what I saw. We will cover all this in more detail shortly. I placed the decal film in the printer. My printer sprays its ink on the upper side, and I bet yours does too. So I followed the instructions, inserted the paper glossy side up, and then printed the page. Don't touch the image, as the ink is still wet and will smudge if you do. I then set it aside to dry overnight. Four hours will generally work and some folks say 30 minutes is long enough to dry, but why push it? If you wish, you can grab an unprinted edge and cut the printed portion from the rest of the sheet with scissors. The unused portion may be reused to print additional decals at a later time. Never use less than a half page in your printer, as it may jam and harm the printer. Don't ask me how I learned this. An evening has passed, and I am now in my shop spraying the decal with lacquer, about six to eight inches from the surface and in light coats. Start outside the decal and go past the decal before stopping the spray. Then wait. Yes, it's about as interesting as watching paint dry, but dry it must. You can come back in 90 minutes and give it another. One thing uh, that's not uh, obvious here, when you spray the lacquer on top of this trouble way because of the pressure of the aerosol, but if you just take a loop of masking tape and put it on the back and then print it, works a lot better. Other coat, but then let it dry overnight. Your patience will be rewarded. Keeping the application details brief, 
Know that before applying any decal, you need to make sure the surface is glossy, so give it a spray. I am not an airbrush kind of guy, so I use an aerosol can. Give the surface time to dry, like overnight. Another day has dawned, and we are ready to apply the decal. There are a lot of videos on the topic, and I am going to take some shortcuts here. Since this is an NMRA clinic, I am assuming that you are an NMRA member and have access to the great clinics from nmra.org. Just click on the Education tab, then on NMRA Videos, enter your identification credentials, and click on the Login button. A search screen will appear and enter Applying Water Slide Decals and click on the search button. A clinic by Trevor Marshall and Pierre Oliver will appear, so open the clinic and pay attention. When the glossy surface is dry, we are ready to apply the decal. Cut it from the sheet as close as possible to the artwork. I use a pair of $3 decal scissors from the hobby shop and I like them a lot. But if you are a sharp hobby knife, cutting mat, and ruler kind of guy or gal, by all means feel free to cut out the decal that way. I prepare the now glossy object surface with some brush applied microset from Microscale, the blue bottle on which I have marked the number one because I can never remember whether the blue or the red bottle goes on first. Then I drop the decal into a bath of room temperature water. I leave the decal in the water for about one to two seconds, pull it out of the bath, and then wait 25 to 50 seconds before attempting to place the decal. Larger decals take longer time. Then I place the decal. Use tweezers if you like, but since many of these decals are large, I often just use my fingers. I move the decal around with a dental pick until I like the placement. I then let it dry overnight. Yes, again, overnight. The next day, if you see a bit of air under the decal, something folks call silvering, try pricking the air pockets with a pin or other sharp object, then applying a bit of Microsol, the red bottle on which I have marked a number two which will soften the decal and let it snuggle down into place. Don't try to move the decal at this stage or be upset when the decal begins to crinkle. Then set it aside. I don't use Microsol on every decal as it tends to damage my custom decals, something I have not heard reported on commercial decals. If the decal was placed on sheet styrene or a well sanded surface, you may be able to forget this step. So use your eyes and common sense. When the drying time has elapsed, if you want to get rid of the glossy effect, just give it a spray of dull coat or some other surface coating. That's the part most people have seen before, but the fun is just beginning. Now we are going to use computer software to design our own custom decals. I am going to start by using PowerPoint 2010 because it is what I have and know. If you have another drawing package, such as LibreOffice Impress, I bet there are similar features, but PowerPoint is what I am using for this clinic. Let's start with the absolutely easiest custom decal, a depot sign. In PowerPoint, I click on the Insert tab and then on Text Box. I position my cursor somewhere on the page and then click the left mouse button to start drawing a text box. Then drag the mouse to the opposite corner and release the mouse button. And we have drawn a box. We then enter the name of the depot from the keyboard. In my case, the name is Baden. I would like a border around the depot name. So I right click on the line which defines the edge of the box and then on format shape. I click on line color and then on solid line and then make sure the color matches my need and close the box. I generally like aerial type 14 point 
and PowerPoint's default is something else. So I highlight the text and make the necessary changes. You could change the color of the text as well. But I bet the box is either too large or too small. So I click on a corner and drag it to a size I like. Once I get all my colors to my liking, I set the background color of the text box to no color and print it on clear decal paper. So the background color will pass through perfectly. Or if I am going to print on a different background color than the underlying structure, I will usually print on white decal paper. For the depot, since the sign will be probably placed on white styrene, either decal paper will probably work. That's it. You have made a depot sign and can print it on decal paper and, well, you know the rest. I want to place the decal on a flat piece of styrene before mounting it to the roof of my depot. Evergreen models, part number 119, 129, or 139 styrene strips should work well for anything 14 point or Those small. Those styrene numbers from Evergreen are each uh, strip styrene one quarter inch wide. And the 14 point type uh, fits on that pretty well because, well, there's 72 points in, a, uh, in an inch. So uh, 14 point on an 18 point or quarter inch strip, it works pretty well. But if you want something larger, you can always cut a backer board out of sheet styrene. I always paint the edges of any sign affixed to styrene. It just makes it pop a bit more. Beyond a depot sign, there is not much more to making a city limit sign. Just take a piece of Evergreen 8404 for a post and glue it to the back of a depot sign and you have a city limit sign. Drill a number 40 hole in your layout, plant it, and glue it in place. If you want to include population or elevation, just make these details smaller than the city name and center justify everything. You will probably need to cut the backer board from sheet styrene, as I don't believe Evergreen makes any strips wider than a quarter inch. Now let's make a nameplate for a barn. My grandfather had Breezy Lane Farm on the side of his barn, with a red background and white letters. No problem. We treat it as if we were creating a depot sign and enter the name of the farm. Next, we right-click on the border and again select Format Shape. This time we select Fill, Solid Fill, and then click on a red color. We then highlight the text, right-click on it, select font and change the type color to white and adjust the type size and face if desired. Finally, we resize the box to meet our needs. But I wanted a white outline around the name. I again selected the shape and then again on format shape. This time I made the line color solid and white and thickened the style to two points. Because the page is white, I can't see my borderline but it is there, trust me. Now I am going to add another shape, a slightly larger rectangle filled in red and overlay it on the name of the farm. With this larger rectangle still selected, I click on Arrange and Send to Back. I select both boxes and center justify everything. After we place it on a piece of white styrene and trim it, we are ready to place the sign on the barn. This technique of adding a specifically colored background where we would like the white lettering to show through will prove useful later on, like when lettering rolling stock. Let's go back to the ice cream truck and cover a few more details. I wanted the text to curve, and we can do that in PowerPoint, but it is not too intuitive, so listen up. If you miss a portion, there is a link to a detailed description of the technique on my website, http colon slash slash daacm dot github dot io. It all starts with clicking on the insert tab, then on shapes, then on the curly line icon, the one that looks like a sine wave, not a backwards S. 
I move the mouse to some open area on the page and left click. Then I move it to another place and click again. I do this a third time because a curly line must have at least three points. When I am done adding points, I double click. Now I right click on the shape and then on edit points. I can click on a point to move it around, add more points, delete points, and so on. I can click on a point to select it and then click on the white boxes to change its slope. For the ice cream truck, I kept things simple and drew a simple upward pointing parabola. Now we need to add text. I right click on the curve and click on edit text. I enter the text I desire, but I am always dismayed that the text color is white and I am probably on a white background so I can't see it. No matter. I just highlight the text area and right click. I select the font menu item and change the color, size, typeface or whatever I want. I can see the type now and it is linked to the curve but it still is not curved. To get the text to curve I click on the curve and then on the word format under drawing tools. Next on text effects. If your PowerPoint window is too narrow, you may not see text effects, so make the window as wide as possible and text effects will appear. I click on text effects, then transform, and finally on follow path. I choose a path like a hill and the text curves. To get rid of the curved line, I click on the curve, then on format shape, then line color, and finally on no line, and close the panel. If the curve is too extreme, just click on one of the side boxes to alter the overall shape. Yes, it's complicated, but it works, so give it a try. But what about the ice cream images? Well, the internet is full of clip art and images, so I just asked Yahoo to find me clip art, ice cream. The first part of the page was text intensive but I scrolled down and there I saw a bunch of clip art images. I found one of an ice cream sundae and clicked on it to view an image enlargement. I liked what I saw. I generally do like the clip art images from Clip Artix. So I right clicked on it and saw options to copy the image or save it to a file. Either one would work, but I decided to copy the image, return to PowerPoint, and pasted the image into my work area. It was way too big, so I just clicked on a corner point of the image and reduced its size until I was satisfied, and then moved it to where I wanted it. I repeated the operation for an ice cream cone and a popsicle. I used the rotation point to rotate the image and grouped everything into a single object. I was ready for printing. The sign for St. Paul's Bazaar is similar. I drew a curved line, this time pointing down, and added the text. Each line is in a different color, and the bottom two lines are smaller. Once I had what I liked, I changed the line color to No Line. To get a shape outline, I selected a curved shape, sized it, and grouped everything. How about some traffic signs? To get the traffic signs, I just drew a square shape, right clicked on it, used the format shape and size to make sure it was square. You should uncheck lock aspect ratio when altering just one dimension of an image, then recheck it when you have a perfect square or circle. Then I just altered the background color and line thicknesses as desired. For the railroad crossing, I had to add the black X and RR as separate items, size them as desired, and then group them together. Now, on to a highway marker, and I wanted a Route 66 sign. I started by searching the internet for an image of a sign I liked, and when I found one, I copied it and placed it into PowerPoint and decided to outline it. 
I just started by adding a free form shape and kept adding and moving points until I got a half shield. When I liked what I saw, I copied it and reflected it, making sure I had the top of the two sides aligned. I added the horizontal line and the topography, appropriately centered and sized, then grouped the whole thing. It was a bit of work, but took less than an hour. A link to this and all of the images I describe here is on my handout. But clip art isn't the only thing we can download from the internet. Photos are useful, especially for billboards. Again, using Yahoo's search engine, I looked for knee-high billboard images and found one I liked. So I copied it to the clipboard and pasted it into PowerPoint. But the image needed cropping. I clicked on the image and on the right side of the ribbon is an icon labeled Crop. When I click on Crop, handles appear, which I can use to home into the area that interests me. When I have selected the part of the image I want, I just click away from the image, the unwanted portion disappears, and the remainder can be resized as desired. You can do a lot with rectangular photos from the internet, but sometimes, like in the case of the photo of Don Knotts, there is a background that I want eliminated. Yes, PowerPoint does have a feature to remove the background from an image, but I have not been too successful with it to date. In these cases, I use Photoshop Elements. Once an image is opened, I use the magic wand tool to select an area of interest and then click on the erase button from the keyboard to erase that portion of the background. Sometimes I alter the tolerance to select more or less of the image. And sometimes I have to select and delete multiple times to get all of the background erased. Sometimes I use the select all function and then the eraser to remove the last few artifacts. Sometimes I erase too much and have to use the edit undo function to back up a step. When I get the image just the way I want it, I copy it and paste it into PowerPoint. With the background color eliminated from the photo, I can place the decal on a non-white surface and don't have to be super careful in cutting out the decal when using clear decal film. I like to put decals of product photos on billboard supports, and how to do that is the subject of my billboards clinic. Suffice it to say that you can cut out an appropriately sized piece of styrene for a backer board, add a frame, apply the decal to the workpiece, add legs, back strut, and a boardwalk, and glue it all together. If that sounds intimidating, there are 3D models of billboard legs and a boardwalk under my DAACKM moniker on Thingiverse, so give them a try. They're all HO scale, but I have sizes for billboard images ranging in height from 8 to 16 feet. Sometimes I place the decals on the sides of buildings to show the business of the primary occupant or as a bill publicizing the feature film of the town theater. I was surprised by the opacity of white decal paper. This image shows the same decal. On the left, the decal was placed directly on a red brick surface, and the one on the right was placed on bricks painted white. There is some difference, but not as much as I expected. I used the background removal technique in creating signs for Merrimack Caverns and as you will see later on a sign for a Holiday Inn. Pixel editing, as it is called, can be a lot of work, but also can be highly rewarding if you get an image you really want. This scene is probably the one I have the most extensive use of custom decals. I modified a 3D structure of a model of a diner I found on Thingiverse. I removed some of the upper detail work and boarded up the windows of Bubba Joe's shop for beer, brats, bait, and bullets after a store in a neighboring county. Most of these used clear decal paper. The beer caps are on 3D printed backers to get better adhesion to the fence, but the one for Miller is placed directly without any backer. 
I drew the background for the shop name using the edit points trick. Yeah, it's kind of cheesy, but everyone needs something on the wrong side of the tracks. Perhaps it could use some weathering, but I'll leave weathering to those who enjoy it more than I do. I have one last piece of software to show you, and this is for generating graffiti. I know that graffiti is not everybody's thing, but visit http colon slash slash www.graphwriter g r a f f w r i t e r dot com and click on the create graffiti button. Just down and to the left of this button is a box with the word sample in it. Click in this box and replace the word sample with your name or other text. Leave the text size at 100 for now and select the text color and click on the submit button. The website will generate some graffiti for you. Play around with the effects, the presets, and the fonts. Play with the colors and fades. When you have something you like, just right click on the drawing and copy it to the clipboard. I like to set the background top and bottom gradients to transparent so that I can just copy the image to PowerPoint and size it more flexibly there. Or you could paste the image into Photoshop and have a lot of fun with blurring the edges and other advanced effects. If you use an Android cell phone, there is an app called Graffiti Creator which looks interesting. It has bubble letters which GraphWriter is lacking but to get the images to PowerPoint may require doing a screen capture from your cell phone and then emailing the images to your PC. I hate my cell phone, but Ron Marsh of Ron's Trains and Things has made it work, so you might want to take a look at it. I did make a decal for the side of a boxcar on the Baden vote in Dismet. I started with a decorated commercial model removed the old railroad specific markings and replaced them with those of the BVD. I wanted both white lettering and transparent film and I attempted to get the effect by using white decal paper and putting white lettering on a brown background. Unfortunately white coloring appeared around the edges. I tried to paint the edges but I was not pleased with the results. Perhaps preparing decals for rolling stock is beyond the scope of our home-based techniques. We have placed decals on structures, vehicles, billboards, and rolling stock, and even have made our own freestanding signs. But that's just the beginning. I have some other support structures on Thingiverse that can be downloaded and printed on a 3D printer, then decaled. Things like a hanging for sale sign for the front yard an entry banner for a county fair, a sandwich board, and several more. These are sized for the sample decals which are available from my website at http colon slash slash daacom.github.io. Many of these supports I designed using PowerPoint as a 2.5D computer-aided design package which I hope to be the subject of a new model railroading clinic in the early summer. Until then, feel free to use these designs as you see fit. 3D printed signs tend to be a bit toothy, so give them a few extra coats of gloss before applying your decals. This is my largest decal to date. It measures four and a quarter by three and a quarter inches almost three stories tall in HO. It started with a scanned image and using Adobe Photoshop Elements I eliminated all the background objects. I did not attempt to decal the star at the top as I judged it to be too delicate. The support structure is decaled on both sides which I achieved by copying the Holiday Inn script to a separate file, copying and reversing the entire image, using Photoshop to paint out the text, and finally pasting the Holiday Inn script back into the reversed image. The support structure uses the 2.5D trick discussed earlier. The tower at the top and the bushes at the bottom were the most fragile, so when applying the decal, 
I started at the curved corner and worked my way out to give the fragile parts the most support for the longest possible time. I don't have any structure which can use a sign this large, but it was a fun challenge. This is probably my most difficult decal to date. What made it difficult was not the background shapes, but the topography. It was like nothing I had available to me. I ended up scanning the image I had of the sign and using Photoshop elements, I placed the scan in an underlying layer. I then zoomed into the image, traced the outline of the letters of the hotel name, and created bitmaps that matched the type. Not an easy task, but the final result was worth it. I made decals for both sides of the sign. In the future, I need to look around for some good tracing software because I know the same problem will reoccur. Inkscape looks promising. Finally, on the lunatic fringe is something I hope to make some day. I wanted to create a decal as a mask for a flashing sign. I bought an experimenter's kit for electroluminescent signs from Miller Engineering at http colon slash slash www.microstru.com and found the logo for the old Cats discount drugstore chain that preceded the Walgreens and CVS stores of today. I made a decal of the old cat figure but left the interior lines white, then printed it on clear decal film so that whatever was underneath the electronic sign would show through. I created a 2.5D support structure. But now I can't find the electroluminescent panel which would go between the support structure and the mask. Perhaps this will be a topic for another clinic, masking decals. I know the kit is in my basement somewhere. Now I did eventually find that electroluminescent uh, uh, structure there. I'm going to back up just a little bit here. But now I, okay, uh, I found the decal, I found the image, turned it into a decal. I took that same image and turned it into a backer out of uh, 3D printing. And then I took the electroluminescent panel, which is just something when you give it power, it, uh, it fluoresces. So it would look like, uh, uh, and I'd turn it on and off with an Arduino microprocessor. And uh, it blinked uh, like it was lighting between the backer and the decal. Unfortunately, the electroluminescent panel was really bright. And it wasn't something that I ended up putting on my layout. Uh, but it was a fun little challenge. I can't find the electroluminescent panel which would go between the support structure and the mask. Perhaps this will be a topic for another clinic, masking decals. I know the kit is in my basement somewhere. We are just about out of time, but before Q&A, I want to show you a gallery of other decals I have printed. The gas station needed the company name, so a custom decal was needed. If you look closely, you can see a Texaco clock on the back wall of the office. The engines, transmissions, lubrication was another one, as was the Texaco star above the building. The support structure for the star was 3D printed using Tinkercad design software. I probably should put icons for men and women on the restroom doors. The name of the diner is a custom decal. So is the sandwich board. The sandwich board is built from a pair of flat styrene rectangles with a 30 degree wedge between them. I first tried to 3D print the sandwich board, but the result was not smooth enough for good decal application. I also made a sandwich board with a different decal for the sidewalk in front of a grocery store. Who would have thought you could buy brains for 25 cents, even on a sandwich? How about placing hopscotch layouts on a sidewalk? Here is one of the Sunbeam Bakery. The model is a flour mill from Thingiverse, but the sign support is a 3D model of mine. I printed a business card holder and then decaled it with the name of my railroad. Perhaps someone you know is running for office and needs a campaign billboard. 
Would your grandkids like signs to grandma's house for their Thomas trains? Future projects could include decals for the names and construction dates for brick buildings, as well as hat pins and jewelry customized with railroad logos. Well, that's all we have time for today. Of all the clinics I have developed so far, this one probably has the potential for the most bang for your buck. I hope you give Custom Decals a try. Thanks for listening. Okay. There we are. Q&A time. Excellent. Excellent. That, I learned a bunch of things in doing some, uh, I actually have to do some decals, so that was great learning. Any, anyone have any questions for David? We got to have some, got to have some questions. I, I put them, well, I put them in the chat. Oh, okay. Let's look at, oh, there's some questions in the chat. Um, the websites I'll work with, I'll, I'll work with David to, or to get any of the links and I can put them in, in an email in a future email as well. Um, any other, any other questions? Well, my one con concern about the links was, uh, that they're all the old HTTP format instead of the HTTPS. And I'm having, uh, I get error messages with a lot of HTTPs. Uh, I probably should make some changes there. They, they could be HTTPS as well. Could be your browser. Uh, it's not something that uh, that I I can give you a definitive answer on. I don't know. Okay. I'll just, if I'll, I'll try them with, with HTTPS. But the, what were those links again? Well, let's try HTTPS. Colon. It's a secure link. Yeah. Just put the S after HTTP and then D A A C K M dot G I T H U B dot I O. Oh. Are you on the chat there? It's D A A C K M dot. GitHub, G I T H U B dot I O. Yeah, it's it's in the chat. Uh, David put it in the chat. Uh, I'll put it in there also. So it's. And in that website, as well as a link, if you want to send me an email on something, uh, I'll be glad to give you a, an answer to it as best I can. Mr. Ackerman, Dave Gibbons here. Yes, sir. Um, just curious, I there's a certain uh, old wooden structure way the north where I am. I've driven by where it has a sign. It's an old patent medicine sign. Yeah. That is badly faded, and I'm curious if you had to approach that, would you actually try to attack in in the computer? Would you try to somehow fade the image that way? Or would you, how, how might you approach that given, given what you've taught us today? Are you uh, interested in taking a, a modern, crisp, clear rendition and uh, weathering it down or taking the old one and bringing it back to uh, as it may have looked the day after it was painted? Uh, I want to get the, the, to have the weathered look where a lot of the, the paint, the original paint is gone and the structure is showing you know, the, the wood of the structure is showing through. Yeah, I am not a good weathering guy. You probably can find uh, 99 out of 100 will be better than I am on that. Yeah. Uh, I know that sometimes I've seen um, work with uh, taking masking tape and uh, pulling it off of the decal. Um, I'm, I, I'm not good at that. No, no, I'm, I'm thinking actually of, of taking the digital image before you make the decal and attacking it there. To... Okay, Do it, Okay, doing it that way as well, uh, rather than the mechanical doing it computer-based. Right. Um, yeah, I, don't, I know a little bit about Photoshop where I've seen 
uh, washes applied to it. Uh, and I know that can be done. I have not done it, but that'd be probably how I would attack it. Um, All right. I might take the entire image and uh, you can go in and you can alter the brightness uh, or the or the color coordinates of it for the, the HSI hue saturation intensity. Right. Uh, you know, that'd be what I would do. And I'd have to do it in Photoshop. I wouldn't be able to do it in PowerPoint. Right. Uh, yeah. And you could maybe uh, use that magic wand tool in Photoshop to pick out uh, parts of it which are approximately the same color and then apply a, a, a wash type of thing on top of it. Uh, that'd be where I would try first. Thank you. All right, Phil, I think well, we've David, yeah, taken care of. I think great session. Uh, it's actually sometimes great. There's not a lot of questions. I think the one comment that was made was I have to go rewatch it to be able to keep track of everything. So I think that was a great comment. Any clinic that people think they have to go back, that they'd like to go to back to rewatch to learn more is, is obviously a great clinic. Um, well, thank you. It's my style to, to kind of be like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, and I give you everything I can as, as dense as I can. And uh, yeah, then you can go back and play it back again. And uh, also go to that website. Sometimes after I find out how to do something, like uh, I'm kind of intrigued by uh, David Gibbons' question there. If I learn how to do that, I'm going to put another entry in my website, which will talk about how to uh, do electronic weathering. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, everybody give, uh, give David a hand. And of either a physical hand or a virtual hand, whichever works. And uh, well, thank, thanks, David. And we're now going to go ahead and close our, our formal um, couple of clinics today. Yes, David. One final question for you, Phil. Uh, I am working on my volunteer certificate. I got my author certificate back in uh, August. And by teaching these clinics, every time I teach one, I get a point toward Absolutely. my volunteer AP. Could you send me an email acknowledging that this event took place? I absolutely will. I fully understand. That's one of the, that's, that's one of those uh, carrots we have to encourage folks to, to do clinics. Um, and, and Earl is moving along well if he's not actually achieved his MMR, I think. So um, he's, he's one of our prolific clinicians. So with that, I, th I think what we're going to do is kind of is now step back into, you know, kind of bring what you're modeling. And I know David Gibbons has something to show that he's been doing on on his kind of developing. So, David, why don't you go ahead and take it away first and then we'll kind of go from there to anybody else's um, things they want to show. And then we'll, we'll close by talking about if there's anyone who has anything specific to do for two weeks from now. Go ahead, David. David, you're muted. Hello there, everybody. Um, I would say ladies and gentlemen, but I'd be using gentlemen loosely, but we'll go from there. Um, I want to share my nightmare. Um, I have plans uh, when my current family responsibilities are over to um, be able to have a railroad I've dreamed of, which would be a somewhat larger railroad than um, I have ever run on as a home layout. I've run on club layouts and did participate and led efforts to have two large club layouts with CMRI systems running signaling, dispatch, the whole nine yards. And uh, now that I'm back in the hobby and active and catching up after a couple of decades, it's like everybody, or not everybody, but I heard, oh, there's this JMRI thing. It's great. And so I said, I'm going to, and let's see, which is right side up. Here we go. And what did it do? There we go. I got busy. This is a Chubb designed board called an S-mini. It's a serial uh, input-output card to connect your computer to your railroad. It has pretend block occupancy 
one real block occupancy, a Chubb uh, DCC optimized detector. It has a control for throwing a turnout. It has a driver board to drive a switch machine, a tortoise. It has a driver aboard here, a bunch of outputs which are configured to drive signals. And here you see three lead LEDs, which can do red or green. And this is a fake layout, which is a pretend turnout. You can see the locomotives on the turnout. It is currently live on DCC. There's the DCC system to actually drive the locomotive. And if you look at the detector board, you can actually see the detector board is seeing the locomotive. And all of this hoo-ha is to try to figure out how to use JMRI, which is a Java-based interface that lets you control your railroad and do all sorts of bells and whistle things. And I've got to tell you, it is not something that is a panacea. Um, I've been a high-tech worker. I did all the Chubb stuff and everything else, but I'm finding it very, very much a challenge trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, lots of dead ends, and uh, some people have given me some advice, but uh, it is being a very, very uh, challenging uh, experience. The building the electronics is something I've done all my life. That that was no big deal, but uh, making this sucker work um, is being rather challenging. I don't know if anybody else has mastered uh, JMRI, but if anybody uh, is wanting to uh, look over my shoulder as I wrestle with this simple test bed here, I would appreciate it. And I'll take any uh, comments, uh, even that of you're out of your flipping mind uh, at this time. And the crickets tend to tell me that nobody else, everybody else is smart enough to not do something like this. <laughs> well, we'll have a conversation. We need to have a conversation because I think what you're learning would be very helpful for what we're trying to do in Pleasanton with the JRMI and Chubb and all that. So I, there's definitely some interest there, but I think it's better as a separate conversation than here. Yeah, it was just, it's what I'm working on right now. So it's sort of a, for what it's worth. Yep. Hey, I'm going to go down the hey. and watch TV. I bought a, a couple of snacks and you do need to talk, okay? I love you. Miss Anti Social. Should we ask what that conversation is about or should we let it go? We always just let them go. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the danger of not becoming a muter. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, wow. I, you know, so my, my favorite story about that, so since we're here, it's interesting. Very early on, on a different, it was not on our event, but a different event. Someone was making a clinic presentation and someone had left their mic open and you heard her, his, his wife say, what are you doing? And he says, I'm watching this, it's boring as hell. And of course, it did a lot for the confidence of the presenter of the clinic to have somebody in the audience say, oh, I'm sitting here watching this boring as hell. So created quite a bit of consternation in the session, quite frankly. Uh, muting is important. Uh, I just have one uh, item. Good. That I'd like to do a quick show and tell on. Um, I've been having a problem with decals, white decals printed on, on the very light blue uh, paper from micro scale and, 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 uh, and my friends who do decals and so forth, and also national scale car. Um, and so I finally found a solution and it, it's rather simple. I went out and, and bought um, one of these, gotta, it, 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 hold on. Tur Let's turn off your, turn off your virtual background. Go next to stop yeah. video and turn okay. off. Yeah. Cause it's hard. Uh, it, actually my virtual's off. Oh, no, you've got, is, you've got fade. You've got fade on. I've got blur on. Blur okay, on. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Sorry. 
it's always interesting to see how the AI interprets things you hold up and tries to turn them into yeah. a human being. Okay. There you go. All You're right. good. Let's You're go good. here. All right. Anyway, I went out and found this. It's it's an LED adjustable illuminated tracing light box. And what it is, I can put these very light background white de uh, lettering decals on top of this with the, the, the backlight and actually sort of pencil out where I want to cut the decal. And it, it turned out for a $19 uh, investment to, to be a solution. I, I, that's actually a really interesting potential tool for a lot of things where you want to illuminate things through to be able to see things if you're cutting and marking and stuff. Could be very interesting for a lot of applications for a $20 uh, backlight. Yeah, the site, the surface isn't good for cutting. I need to cut no. the surface up. But, uh, but yes, it's, it's built for tracing. So that you can put a page down there and then put something over it and trace it. That's very oh. interesting. Uh, let me just share. My father was a cartographer, Dave Ackman here, uh, and uh, actually was part of the team that mapped the moon. Uh, and they took pictures like that. And then they used a, a stylus to engrave it. Uh, his title was a negative engraver. So that was what was done in the late 60s to map the moon. Yeah. The problem with old light boxes is you never had the intensity. But now with an LED flat light surface, you're able to get that intensity localized in, in a very, you know, uh, uniform uh, area. Uh, very true. That was done with fluorescent lights back in the 60s. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's an interesting thought because if you use thinner styrene, it's fairly transparent. So you could put a fairly transparent mo picture or print out a, even a, a, um, a transparency of a, of, a, uh, of a design of a model, of an actual print of, of a um, uh, design layout of a model. You could print that out, put that on there and lay the styrene on and probably see the lines through the styrene to be able to mark them, to mark out some complex shapes. That's kind of interesting to think about how you could use that in lots of different ways because projecting lots of light through things can let you do interesting things. Yeah, it just, it was a, it was a need. Cool. And, and I just happened to discover this. I had a long conversation on the uh, real freight car uh, group uh, where we're trying to figure out ways to to, to to handle this light decal paper problem, particularly those of us getting old and couldn't quite get the right angle of light to see the, the smaller decals, uh, such as uh, railway uh, marks and so forth. And by the way, one add to David's thing, uh, you know, I did the um, dry transfers. There's a, a company in Vancouver called Action Graphics. And his comment to me, we went through the process is that he does the dry transfers used by Steinway pianos on the inside of the piano. So when you open the Steinway piano up and it's all that brilliant black lacquer in that, and it's got the Steinway letters there, those are his dry transfers that they use. And it was about 25, you had to do the dry transfers in um, Adobe Illustrator. So you had to go get a, and learn to use that. But what I do is I took some di some things done in PowerPoint designs and moved them over into Illustrator and then did the text in Illustrator. I did a, I don't know, it was like an 11 or 12 by eight sheet or something like about this big. And it was just all lettering for cars. And it cost about $25, I think, to generate the film. So you gave them the, the, the file, they generated the film to do it. And then it was about $25 a sheet. I think I paid, this was, this was a few years ago. It's probably six, seven years ago. I think it was about 75 or 80 bucks for two sheets, which would letter, you know, a lot of cars. Um, you know, I had six, six of the, the passenger car top lettering scenes, for example, on each sheet. So you could do, you know, essentially six passenger cars with those two sheets and probably 50 or 60 freight cars. So yeah, that, it's actually it's actually the process is very similar to what David talked about. It's just you send it to them and they create the dry transfers. Yeah. And by the way, the, the one key thing I learned with that, if you ever do dry transfers, is heating the model slightly is really important. 
dry transfers work much better if you've warmed the model a little bit with an air gun, just a little bit, not too much, so you melt anything, but where it's warm, you get much better transfer adhesion and having some, some tooth to whatever you're transferring to. So kind of a different technique. Well, Dave Connery here. One one other solution to Ken's problem that I've just used sometimes uh, on on white printing on almost white paper. Uh, I I paint the back of it with a little bit of like red uh, India ink, and that that stains the paper backing. Uh, but when you peel, uh, take it off, uh, soak it off, the lettering, the white lettering, comes out white still, and but it makes it easy to see the white lettering on the reddish background then. Dave, I tried several things, uh, but but I ruined a lot of decals d doing it. <laughs> so I, well, I, I finally like I found said, it this. worked for me with India ink. Yeah. Well, I I I, I used uh, uh, the um, marker pens, um, not not the the permanent marker, but but the the. Um, regular uh oh, whatever they you know we get them all the time um marker pens and try to use to, to highlight the white lettering and uh the decals were messed up hey you know i wonder if you just sprayed the backing paper on the back side with with black paint just put it down with the with it down just spread it with a light colored black paint and that would darken yeah. it so when you turned it over you know, it's kind of the same thing David suggested with the ink, but if, if you sprayed it, it would just be laying on the back side of the paper. That might darken enough that you could actually see the white much more effectively. Um, and then when you take the backing paper off, the paint goes with the backing paper. Yeah, I, as you know, I'm sort of averse to spraying things. No, no, I, that's not just other options. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, I came up with a light box. It, it, that's great. I think that light box is a really cool. I, I'm, yeah, and it, it's, it doesn't require any pre-prep for the decal, like spraying it. Yep. That's good. Joyce, go, go ahead. Just You don't need to raise your hand. Just jump in. Well, I have some fun stuff to share. And you guys make you laugh, I hope. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, you sure can. It's uh, for the few people that are left here, uh, if you don't know me, I am uh, very electronically challenged. So I'm very happy with myself right now. You should see a, a little picture of a, a slide switch, correct? Yep. Well, I burned out a wall wart. And I couldn't figure out why I burned out the wall wart, because it was supposed to be able to support 30 tortoises. And I only had 20, so I, I did my homework, right? I, I read. And so I grabbed another one and sent it on a suicide mission, not understanding this. <laughs> and it burned out too. Okay, so then all my EE friends told me how to do this with a voltmeter. And I hooked the voltmeter up there and I, I hooked this one tortoise up and it went from like 0.25 amps to 14.77. Uh, <laughs> And so I was real happy. And then I, I went looking for the short and you can see it right here that the, one of these little wires just clicked over was making a connection. So I was ecstatic that I was able to figure that out. So there's the first chuckle for the day is, you know, there are people out there like me. And if you're one of them, you know, you should be laughing. Uh, a little bit of rail fanning here in Richmond, the Richmond Pacific. We are out looking for a good place to eat breakfast. There's a little restaurant uh, about 200 yards to the rear of the engine here. And uh, it was a rainy day. So all they had is outside dining, so we didn't stay. But I figured a nice picture. Um, here's another chuckle for you. Laying track. Uh, I was laying out my railroad and I decided to run the first train. And I came to the conclusion that I needed a crossover here. Okay, so I stuck the crossover in. The whole idea was to get it so that the train would not have to go into the yard. It could go by in a main line. Well, here's the finished product. I don't know if you take a good look at this one and then take a look at what actually transposed. Uh, if you can't see it really clear is the first one as I cut it in here, drilled all the holes. This is a yard lead. And this is the reason it needed the crossover. This goes into the other side of the yard. So we needed a crossover for it to stay on the main. 
but without thinking and the World Series was coming on, I got into a rush and I started cutting it into this spot right here. So once I came back out, looked at it, realized it was wrong. I realized it's time to go sit down, have a beer, watch the World Series. But, uh, you know, sticky notes are a good thing to put on there when you're planning something and you don't have time to see it all the way through. So, I don't know, just a couple of yucks. But I, I really love that one. I'm building a spaceship now and I will be selling tickets for a to be designated launch date. But you're up, at, you're up on your own on that one. So, okay, that's it. Cool. So James, actually an, an interesting thought process where we started in Pleasanton, actually just came through it last night. Um, we occasionally have derailments. And one of the issues is understanding if the derailment is what I will call happenstance or if it's consistent. And it turns out at Train Mountain, what they do is that everybody gets, is given little blocks of wood. I think they're painted green. And if you have a derailment or an issue, you drop the block of wood next to the track. And then they have people that drive around. If they see one block of wood, they don't pay any attention to it. But if they start seeing three or four blocks of wood at a location, they say there must be a problem there. If there's 10, then it's immediately considered a problem. So what we're doing is we're going to stain a bunch of just ties. And anytime someone has a problem, drop a tie there. And then use that as identifications of places where we need to focus some track maintenance. So I think it's kind of an interesting idea as you begin to roll a layout out to think about how do you mark problems where there are points where there are problems? Because, you know, if you assume that 50, just random numbers, 50% of the problems are caused by the rolling stock and 50% are caused by the track. That means 50% of your derailments have nothing to do with the track. So developing a program to find consistent points, I thought was a, a really interesting concept that came up from what they're doing up there. So just a thought process for anyone building a big layout going through the, I'll call it the, uh, the run-in phase where you're trying to get consistent operations. I, I call it the oh shit phase. <laughs> <laughs> the oh shit phase, that's probably, probably a good example too. Um, I, I, I just thought it was a great idea. It was, by the way, it was not my idea. It was Dick Stark brought it down from Train Mountain and he and one of the other guys talked through how to do it. So it's, I just thought it was a super idea. And, Kind of bring it up as you talk about track work and making great decisions. Certain yeah, I, I parts of map sessions, uh, if you give people access to little stick pins, yep, because they all want to come and tell you it, it's derailing here, and you're like, right. I really don't want to hear that right now. <laughs> so yep. When you but, get done and you find ten stick pins in a spot, you know right. you better take care of it for the next Sa session. Same exact thing. And, Certain and also parts work with cars too. If you have a car that derails all the time, put a sticky note, not a you know, a little sticker on the top and you tell somebody if it derails to put a little mark on it. And pretty soon you'll see this car has got a little sticky on the top and has 10 marks on it. And you know that something's really wrong with that car. So. That's a great idea. That's a great extension to do sticky marks for the cars and ties yeah, or pins for the little, track. Uh, and Circular stickers, you know, you can put on yep. there a little, little one just so that you can see that there's a problem here. Certain uh, track work sections can also be, how shall I put it? in specification but they're good at spotting rolling stock that has a problem right which is the other the other direction it'll hit which is yeah it's always happening there but it's because it's laid correctly but piece of equipment that maybe the trucks don't pivot correctly or something and it'll find them for you yeah the one that i'm going to be looking at here is of uh, i've been using atlas switches and i like them but I know there's something going on with the frog when the wheels go over it, they dip a little bit. And I was wondering if anybody knows what thickness of styrene you put at the bottom of those things to kind of take care of that deep ditch. So I, know I, I can find that online somewhere, but I figure it's always a good question. So. Yeah, yeah, David, that's actually a really interesting thought you brought up, which is if you took an area of track and actually set the rails narrow to the minimum to the widest and then put in guardrails and had guardrails at both the minimum and the maximum and as the cars go through it you know i engineer a piece of track that was at the edges of the track specification to try to detect slightly out of specification cars that's actually a really interesting thought to create like a yard on your yard lead or something a place that would find bad cars a bad car detector track section that's a really interesting thought i like that 
that's good. That's good. I'd like to have some creative thoughts here. Uh, well, we're at 1047, and the last topic I really wanted to talk about was for two. Oh, Jenna, Joyce has something. Joyce, go for it. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'm really excited. My sister found my father's uh, pin from the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen. And this is his 25 year, it's really tiny, so you can't see it, but I'm super excited to, that she found it. And it's 25 years, he worked his entire life, probably, I guess, close to 50 years for the railroad as a um, freight inspector. And I want to thank, there's been some guys among you uh, who have helped me to, he worked for the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, Transcontinental Freight Bureau. And some of you have been helping me to find information about that organization. It was, it was not a specific railroad, but they inspected freight for all the different railroads. And he worked in San Francisco. So, um, and the third real brief thing, I'm trying to get ready for the, my, I used to give a promontory party every, every year. I live in El Cerrito and I have an outdoor layout that you can see behind me. And um, I finally, I'm excited, I found both, uh, I have G-Scale, and I found both of the G-Scale trains, locomotives that are from the uh, promontory, you know, the Jupiter and the 419. And uh, one of them doesn't run, it's just a G-Scale ceramic thing but it's about the right size and it's colored right and so if any of you find the right thing where it really will move please let me know and if any of you want to be invited to the promontory party it will happen hopefully next year outdoors um, at my house at uh, around may 10th so let me know i'm at metronome the number seven, metronome seven at AOL.com, and I'll add you to the invitation list. Oh, you should mention that the Jupiter is the one that you have that actually runs. Okay. Yeah. Thank now, you. Thank you, everybody. Joyce, that ceramic model is probably right up there on the meeting the weight standard, though. That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Uh, it's really cool looking. And so I'm going to have, oh, and uh, I'm asking people to, there's uh, pictures on a place called Granger, and I'm sure other places that have historical pictures. And I've found some promontory pictures there. And I ask people to dress up in some kind of outfit that you see on one of those pictures. It can just be work clothes and a shovel. There's a lot of guys lined up with shovels in one of the pictures, uh, or it can be a train hat, anything that's train, uh, that looks old fashioned train. So we have a good time. I've done this a couple times. And uh, so anyway, if you wanna be invited, let me know. I'll wear my Victorian working man's outfit. Great, great. So send me your email address and I'll put you on the invitation list. Yeah, you know, Joyce, it's it's kind of interesting. We did the the 150th as the 2019 focus for the fairgrounds layout in Pleasanton. And in going through that, it kind of it's very interesting when you look at the impact of the Transcontinental Railroad at the time. And we just we kind of don't have the view of how transformational that was for America. I, I think in the history of time, and it's, it's really interesting, having spent time doing this, if someone told me before I did this research and asked me about Lincoln, my whole answer would abound about the Civil War and slavery and all that. And I, not to belittle that at all, but I think you can actually make an argument for the success and long-term best of the United States securing the West with the Transcontinental Railroad may have actually been more important than winning the Civil War. But if you stop and think about them as equally important, right? Basically uniting the Eastern coast of the United States in a single entity 
and using the Transcontinental Railroad to bring California into the United States. Because if you think about it, in, in 1865, 1860, if you were in New York and you had two options, you could go to San Francisco or you could go to London, you would always choose London. Because almost everybody who went to London from New York lived, 5% of people who tried to go to California died. Because if you went around the Cape, you probably 5% of the ships didn't make it. If you went through Panama, 5% of the people got malaria. And if you tried to go in a covered wagon, 60,000 people died. It was more like 20 to 25% of people died doing that. And so, you know, basically to go from that to seven days to get to California was incredibly transformational in bringing the country together and building the country that's today. And I think, you know, it, it really is a very interesting celebration because it is the celebration of the uniting of America to what it is. And I, I think sometimes we forget uh, in the view of history that becomes certain ways that this transportation view of America is incredible. There was a, I think it was on PBS, they had a special about it. And the comment they made was, you know, the railway system that was built starting with the Intercontinental Railroad, Continental, Intercontinental, the, the Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad was, in fact, the Internet of the day. It changed society in that society in ways that the Internet is changing our society in similar radical departure ways the Internet is today. And I thought it was just it's, it's very interesting. So as you do that, I think it's really important to kind of celebrate that fact that it, it really is not just an event that's a railroad event. It's one of the really major events in U.S. history, which we don't really celebrate as much as we should. We, we kind of lose that. I think that's gotten kind of lost because it's thought of as old stuff. But it was the arc of the United States was very much determined, you know, in those years by those two things that Lincoln did. So enough said. I've been reading a book, uh, Rival Rails, um, that is about that whole era. And to, like you say, from going from taking months and maybe losing your life to yep. going through a few days, it just revolutionized the country. And um, when, we, when I do my promontory party, we reenact the actual event. I have the, the scripts and we have a contest for the best um, costume, and whoever wins the best costume gets to read the the script for the event. So, and we it's a potluck, and um, it's outside. So, and you you had to give David more incentive <laughs> for his costume, saying there was going to be a prize. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to come now just to see the outcomes. Um, <laughs> Cool. That sounds great, Joyce. I really appreciate it. I think that sounds like a great opportunity and it's going to be when it's warm and, and it'll come actually between our, Mar hopefully our March event that's an auction and our June event that's going to be in the South Bay. So that'd be a great addition to the calendar. So cool. Phil, separate from this meeting, I need to get together with you to talk about uh, clinics planning and Absolutely. also, you can talk to me about this uh, GMRI project I'm uh, struggling with. Cool. Yeah, no, I was, I was actually sending you an email, so. All right. Does anyone have an update on the uh, destiny of the uh, Sacramento locomotive shops? In terms of... I don't know. Is there new news about something happening? I hadn't heard. So maybe. What there's... are they going to do with the facilities and the land? Anyone know anything about it? Well, you. The proposal is to turn it into like a tech uh, retail place for people to come and go to. But that proposal has been out there for quite a few years. They're looking for money. Yeah. I don't know whether the toxics issues have been fully addressed there because the SP left an immense amount of stuff to be cleaned up. I know they were working on it 20 years ago, trying to dig up the contaminated soil, and I don't know whether they're done yet. Certainly the developers of various sorts are in a lather to get their hands on that land. But first of all, it's got to be uh, habitable, not poison people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've got that big pump that's been pumping groundwater out of there for you know, decades. <laughs> and it's decades more. 
it was interesting to hear one of those guys talk about how they treated stuff they didn't want anymore. They just shove it off the edge into the swamp. <laughs> Uh, we're talking like whole engines that they realized they couldn't repair and they just shove it off a track into the swamp and they were finding stuff down there, you know, so. Wow. Okay, thanks. Cool. Joy, something for you in regards to the promontory event. Have you ever seen the promontory reenactment that's done? No, I want to go to that. Um, there's, I found when we went to Sacramento at the museum mm -hmm. store, I found a new book just came out on un, undoing the rail at the promontory. Cause you know, they took apart all those, tra those rails at that specific location uh, years ago. And so now there's a whole book about that. So I've got that book. I've got every book I've ever could find about the promontory. Um, so any of you that come can read the, that. And uh, but I haven't been there. I wanted to go. I was going to go uh, in 29, you know, when the pandemic hit and, you know, about all that. So yeah, what um, I would recommend to you is on YouTube, go to look for Toy Man Television. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Angel, uh, and his lady have gone up and done a couple of great videos of the current um, repro the, the, the reenactment. And, the Park uh, Service. The Park yeah, Service the, reenactment. Yeah, the National yeah. Park Service reenactment with the rolling stock, and with the locomotives and everything. And uh, it might be of interest to you just to see what, you know, give you a flavor of what it's like to actually be there. I enjoyed watching it very much. Thank you. I will definitely do that. Yeah, Joyce, if, if you look at some of those pictures that you shared, you know, where they have the group of people standing there, you could probably go stand where these people were and the, the region itself, the land has not changed a bit. <laughs> well, well, there's not a, it, no Starbucks, no McDonald's. Yeah. Well, except yeah. the mainline track is a number of miles away now. You right, so it's basically have to bring your own lunch and water and shade. Yeah, yeah I've heard that. Um, my email address, I added it to the chat. So anybody wants my email address to come to the party, uh, it's there. I used to work at, uh, sorry, I used to work at One Market Plaza. And uh, on one of the floors, uh, I think it was the fifth. I'm not sure it's been a while, but there was just a magnificent, gigantic oil painting of the driving of the Golden Spike. And um, the rumor was it disappeared. And uh, the rumor was that Phil Anschutz gave it to one of the uh, VPs of one of the unions. And that's, uh, that's the last I heard about it. My understanding that the, that the photos that were taken were much, with the boys boozing it up, were much more realistic than any paintings were ever made. <laughs> totally sanitized. <laughs> there is a big painting at the museum in Sacramento um, of the promontory event. And yeah. I don't know if that's a similar painting or, or the same one or what, but. The other thing is that there were no Chinese were allowed to that, at that yes. celebration. Actually, what I've read is that the Chinese were being, there was some event where they were thanking the Chinese, actually, at the time when the photos were taken. Um, there, there's a couple of Chinese researchers that work uh, out of Sacramento, at, out of the museum, and they've written two books. And I've read both those books and they're fascinating books uh, written by people who are descended from, uh, who are scientific Rare researchers, workers, yeah. historical researchers. And um, they said that the Chinese were in a party and they were being celebrated, being thanked for the work that they had done. Um, during the time when the pictures were taken. Now, if you were a conspiracy theorist, you would ask the yes. question whether the scheduling of that event at that time was designed specifically to assure yes. there would be no Chinese. I, I, I mean, I'm actually, I'm actually not being that much of a conspiracy theorist. I, 
you know, it's like, well, we don't want a bunch of Chinese. In the, and, and there lots of racism then, by the way, just so everybody understands. Back then, there was incredible amounts of racism. The, the best racism story I ever heard was in Northern California, there were two cities called Igo and Ono. They're about 15 miles apart. And the story is the Chinese built Igo and the whites came in with the guns and chased them out. And it was Igo when they showed up with the guns. They built Ono and when this time they bought guns and when the whites showed up, it was Ono. We're not leaving. So that's the story of Igo and Ono. You can find them on the map up you know, far northern California. As soon as the railroads were built, there were mass shootings of uh, Chinese workmen. Uh, as soon as the trains were set down and the rails were set, uh, a lot of people were shot. So, but those two books I highly recommend. They're in the museum, they're available everywhere by the Chinese researchers. So is, does anyone have a great topic they'd like to talk about in two weeks? My guy. I, Phil, I have that list of people that uh, suggested they could do some presentations. All right. See, this is why David is our clinic's chair is because he. Well, I got to do more work with you because I'm about <laughs> clinic half a chair, but. <laughs> but more than um, me. Let's see. Um, there's uh, some, let's see, my list here, Bob. Gardine Bench Work and Scenery Clinic was one he was thinking about doing. Earl Gorbovan had some photos. Seth Newman was interested in doing a presentation. Uh, some idiot named Gibbons has a, a, some overview of some DCC install and Atherin Blue Box locomotives. Those were uh, some of the ones I had. And some guy named Ed Holm, I think you already presented it, uh, Phil. But that's, yeah. uh, that's some of the stuff I had noted down. So if you have anything you'd like to do, send David an email um, and he'll, he'll throw his email in the text. You know, and by the way, it can be a 10 minute thing. It doesn't need to be a big deal. It's just kind of sharing a little more, you know, something more than you know, kind of doing something just randomly and all that. And the cool thing is if you tell me ahead of time, I can put it in the email so people know it's going to be there. So if it's a topic they're interested in, they can make sure they come. Phil, let me review the points here. To help, I want people to make presentations to help avoid making mistakes you've made. Uh, there, I want to let you know that I feel there are many ways to accomplish a task, and let's see your way of doing it. There's more than one way to do many of these things. Um, it can cover any topic uh, having to do with the hobby. I don't care. Uh, just just sharing your your knowledge, your learnings, good or bad. You don't have to be a master model railroader or a super craftsman. Uh, because different have different skills and abilities, it may be that your method will be one that more people would be successful with than you might think, because you may not be a super oh, thank you. whatever, solderer, okay? But maybe you found another way to make electrical connections that works for you that other people might be more successful with than, you know, somebody who can do it, you know, blindfolded behind their back and do it to ten thousandths of an inch. Um, you know, we need to find ways to help more people succeed. Um, it can be as short as Phil said, it can be five minutes. It doesn't have to be a, a big long thing. You just say, hey, I found out I can do this or I found out you shouldn't do that. So those are those are some of the points I want to Phil, uh, these are some of the points I want to put yeah. into a um, e an email or stuff that we can send out to everybody. Yeah. The other thing is, I, I don't know how much coverage or alignment we had with the clinics from the national convention, but one of the things we could do is ask some of the clinicians who did clinics during the national conventions to redo that clinic here. Uh, you know, and those were all done. The cool thing is those were all done as videos, so we can use those videos and do it very much the way David did and do a clinic here. If there's interest in one of those topics of having somebody come in and talk about it, I think I can get the list and the list is probably up on the web. I'll put a link. And if anybody's there, if there's, if somebody says, Hey, I'd like to see this clinic, send David an email. And if five people say, Hey, I'd like to see this clinic, then we'll contact the clinician and see if they're willing to, most of those guys are, are those clinicians are willing to replicate that for us. If we ask, I think. Phil, the thing is the difference can be as it could be as opposed to the canned presentations. 
They could do it live. They too, did. That's true. They could do. They could do it live or with you right. know run it and then pause and talk to folks so we could get more interaction. Exactly. So I'll I'll send the I'll put the link in for that and send it out at some point, probably in the next email. But you can go just look at the the site if you want to see if there's anything there you're interested. In. If you miss the national convention, we can I think probably pick up at least half of those are pretty easy to pick up because they're folks that we all know pretty well. So well, David and I'll work on it. We'll come up with something great for next week or two weeks from now. Um the only other thing is that we will be starting on the auction and we're generating kind of a volunteer's guide for the auction of description of each of the kind of roles um, to kind of more formalize it. So, you know, one thing is if you're interested in participating in the auction, um, send me an email or Jer an email because we're, we're kind of trying to get names together of folks to talk to about doing different roles in March when we do the auction because I think we've lost about a third to half of the folks that were working the auction before, either because they don't want to, they're just the point they can't do it anymore or other reasons. So um, we're gonna need a little help there. Right, well, by the way, one key role is data entry. So anybody who's really good at kind of instant, the, the person who has to enter the, the bid amount and the successful bidder at the kind of that kind of data entry is kind of the the one job that's really key. So somebody who might be really good at data entry would be a great to identify a couple of people to share that role during the auction. Oh, that 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 landed with a huge thud. That one didn't it? <laughs> I've already I've already volunteered. Already, David's already volunteered. He's going to be one of our new auctioneers. Um. But anyway, I'm Arthur and Locomotive. Do I hear five dollars? Five dollars. Do I hear ten dollars? Ten dollars. Ten dollars is fine. Arthur and Locomotive. Right. <laughs> and and with that, gentlemen uh, and lady, I'm going uh, to run away. It, it's more like, do I hear twenty-five? Twenty-five cents. Twenty-five. 25. <laughs> do I get a quarter? Well, and, and, and by the way, one thing that would be interesting, and, and this is not a decision, but would be interesting to just get people's feedback on. One of the concerns we have for March is that we may have an overwhelming number of items. Um, the second, the, the second concern is that you know, there are a lot of kind of these smaller items that don't sell. So one thing we have talked about is going from a one dollar to a two dollar minimum for the for the auction to to basically aggregate a little bit more into the. And, and 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 by the way, everybody, I tell you know I I think the auctions maybe need to be more like. What we, I did with my dad when I was a kid, we would go to the local auction out at, this is, I live in the country, we go to the local country auction almost every Saturday and he'd take four boxes and he'd put them in to sell and he'd buy four boxes and he'd take the things he wanted out of them, put some things in, mix them up again and take them back the next week to sell. So, so the idea is if there's something in a box, you buy the box, you mix it up with some other stuff and bring it back and sell it the next week, you know, the next time we do an auction in six months. So, you know, in other words, you don't have to buy the, the whole box. It's kind of a content thing. And, and that way we can reduce the number of items because if we end up with 500 items, we're going to be there until seven or eight o'clock at night. And so just kind of trying to think through that. So anybody who's got any kind of feedback on those things, um, great to get everybody's feedback. You know, I was going to say that it, uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, one of the things that I thought might be uh good for the auction is if you put some kind of a and i don't know how you would do this uh, a survey of what people want to bid on because i remember going down that line and everybody's looking at everything and it you've got items that no one wants to bid on and if nobody marks up as wanting to bid on it then you know maybe it should go to a table where somebody can buy it for a buck or something uh, I don't know. It's there, just one there's, of those ideas. there's a secondary act. Uh, there's a there's a, a an interesting way to resolve that, and it's the other thing that I I kind of feel like is the people that are selling the sellers really have no skin in the game. There are things selling. Um, you know, I throw out ten items, and if they don't sell, I take them back, and I throw them out the next time, and. 
when we did the last auction at the Elks, 35 or 37 percent of the items didn't sell. So that means over a third of the volunteer time, a third of the effort, a third of all of our time was basically wasted. And especially if you look at it from the Coast Division, because the Coast Division doesn't economically get any value unless an item sells. Um, one way to do that is to have skin in the game. And the way to do that is to have a listing fee. So basically what it says is when you put an item in, you have to pay a something quarter, 20 cents, some number per item as a listing fee. And the listing fee is paid to list them. And if they sell, you pay 10% of the selling dot price. But if they don't sell, you get your item back, but you don't get your listing fee back. So you've got, you've got actual skin in the game that your item sells. And I you know, it, read the book I wrote, Skin in the Game is one chapter. It's the whole idea of how do you create people having skin in the game so they have a participatory point. And I, personally, I think that's something we, I don't know we'll talk about for March we may want to talk about for longer term. And I'd be really interested in the members' feelings about a listing fee versus what I call the large volume sellers. Um, you know, from an individual member, it's the person who brings in, you know, four items, would you have a problem with an 80 cent or dollar listing fee for your four items? Um, versus, you know, there are other options like a paddle charge or just an attend the event charge. My thought is to kind of associate the things more with the auction, but love to get everybody's feedback on those kind of thoughts. Um, and it, by the way, if you want to participate in those thoughts, we are we have an auction kind of committee going and would love to have anyone who's interested participate in it. Because um, we have to rethink how we do this. We go to two auctions per year and to make them profitable because we're now at the Elks and the Elks is probably going to go to 700 bucks um, for a, they're going to go to $700 for an event there. And our last revenue stream was under 500. So we have a $200 cost gap to cover our cost to go to the rent, go to the Elks. Um, anyway, enough said. The, um, the skin in the game idea makes sense to me is that a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a bit to put in, to, to put up a bit of money to put something in sounds fine. The paddle charge though, sounds like sort of a San Francisco thing. Yeah, I, I think the problem with the paddle charge is I see a lot of people walking around and trying to see if there's something they want to bid on before they pay the paddle charge. And and I think there's I personally I like the idea of people having paddles because they get emotionally they get emotionally engaged and make buying decisions they might not do if they had time to think about it and have to pay for a paddle. I, I'm talking about, I, I, by the way, part of this, I look at the auction kind of as a business we run that generates the revenue that pays for all the things we do. So yeah, it, it, it contextually, it's, it, you kind of have to, from a coast perspective, look at it that way. Um, but enough said. Well, I, I've, I've covered everything I wanted to do uh, or I thought we needed to do. So unless there's something else to go for, I'm probably ready to call it a week or a, a Saturday. So with that, thanks everyone. Phil, Phil what day great. is the auction? It's we're scheduling it for March sixth, which okay. is a Sunday, like we've done okay, before. And yeah, so that's the date we the date we picked. We've reserved that with the Elks. I think we have to make a hard decision about a month before. So probably by February first, we're going to make a hard call. And quite frankly, I may end up sending out another survey and ask, you know, do you feel comfortable being in a room doing an auction in a month? Because I, I just don't know where this is going to be. And it's less about it's less about what I feel about it. It's more about how it, it, we're not going to have an auction if we're only going to have 30 people show up. It's stupid. Um, we need to. We're not going to have an auction until we can get fairly wide participation. I don't I don't see it. I'd rather wait a month or two. And then do it versus doing it in March and being and having only twenty or thirty people show up because people are not um, are not comfortable coming. Um, well, I was just looking at the calendar. I didn't see it on there. That's why I was curious. Right. I yeah. We've got to put it in the calendar there. We haven't put it in yet. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, I, gotta, I mean, it's, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I understand. And that, and that's the reason we pushed it to March was I just, I was, my hope was that that would be out of any winter surges and into the time when we were kind of in the tail of this thing. Um, 
on the other hand, I I, to say it's going to be something we're just going to have to live with like the flu, you know, it's going to come around every year. So I fear that you're right, James. Um, I think that's going to be from what I see, it's going to be something else that humanity learns to live with along with malaria and and we also everything else. We also have to realize it's not entirely our choice because I I believe that the Elks Club currently does not uh, have activities for their own members in the facility. And and so until until that's also worked out, you know, we're kind of at at the at the control of their board. Right. We're we're penciled in the calendar. Well, I think the date and I'd have to go back and, and talk to Brian. He talked to them. Um, I think I remember what he said was about a month ahead was the hard and that'll be a duel, right? They'll say, yes, you can have the event and we'll say, yes, we want to have the event and then we'll lock in the date and that'll probably happen. Like I said, late January, early February. So until then, we really won't know for sure. I attended a Qantas meeting at the Elks, uh, this Wednesday evening, there was 50 people. It's in the same room that we use for the, um, for the auction and, um, uh, the Elks are just fine with it. Well, that gives me real hope. That's great. That's so we should be good then from their perspective, definitely by by March. Have we ever looked into renting a tent and putting it up in a park? No, I, I haven't thought about that one. I mean, it, it, no. it seems to be that they say outdoor is safer, but I mean, I'm not so sure I believe that, but uh you know, I don't know, just different ideas. Uh, it might be cheaper than the 700 bucks, <laughs> but yeah. more complex an organization. So yeah. That's power, shelter from the weather. There's so many details, but I'm going to detail myself out of here. You all have a great time. Uh, I'll talk to you later, Phil, and I'll look forward, Joyce, to uh, coming to your event this coming spring. It sounds wonderful. Be Thank well, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Super. Hey, guys. Yeah, have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for all the work you put into this. Thanks, everyone. Have a great time. And Earl, and I think Earl and David are gone, but one big shout out and thanks to both of them for two great clinics. So have a great weekend, everyone. I'm going to close this one down. Good day. Good day.